bring the positive energy uh, like I know you will. Our panelists are going to bring it for us tonight, and I ask for you to challenge them um, and really get into the detail with them tonight because you have a chance to listen to some special, special talents and people who are doing it, have done it, and really want to serve you tonight. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Let me share my screen. All right. So I'm not going to get in you guys' way. I'll, we have our panelists listed uh, top to bottom here. I'm just going to let our panelists uh, go through in order and introduce themselves. And we're going to get started tonight, guys. Dr. Esquivel, uh, lead the way. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica. I am an Afro-Latinx uh, scientist. I work at Fermilab right now and I am working on the muon G minus two uh, experiment. And the G minus two is actually an equation where we're measuring what is called the G factor and it's theorized to be close to two. So anything off of that points to new physics. Um, and my Twitter handle is actually Dr. Esquivel PhD. Um, but yeah, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> All right. You know what? If we can, uh, Deb, if you don't mind updating that or Dr. Esquivel, if you don't mind putting that inside of the chat feature, uh, we'll make sure that the students have that uh, appropriate. I'm on it. Come on through, Paul. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Paul Faranbi. I'm Nigerian American. So I was born in Nigeria, came to the States when I was four years old. Um, so currently I work as a continuous improvement project leader at Nestle Purina. So really just a fancy way to say I help uh, the company save money by doing different projects. I'm out of corporate headquarters in St. Louis. As you can see there, I'm an Inspire LSAMP alumnus. So I graduated in 2016 and it's an honor to be here with these other panelists. All right, thank you, Paul. Dr. Pierce. Hi guys, my name is Marquisia Pierce. Um, I actually was a McNair scholar at IUPUI um, oh, uh, back in 2000, ooh, shoot, four, <laughs> four or five-ish. <laughs> um, so, and we had a lot of, um, colleagues and friends that was from the LSAP program, so I kind of feel like you guys are my extended family. Um, so I'm really happy to be with you guys. Um, I went ahead, uh, graduated from Purdue and went to Vanderbilt for, uh, my PhD. I was, um, studying molecular physiology and biophysics. And basically I was looking at how vitamin C moves in the brain. Um, and before, before that, while I was a McNair scholar, I actually worked in the School of Dentistry. Um, we were looking at how cavities form. Obviously that's very, <laughs> School of Dentistry are interested in cav how cavities form. Um, uh, but I've always had this bent for, how do you get science outside the lab into like my community people to actually use the stuff that I was working on so I've always been into commercialization uh, so I went to get my MBA to get that business part of um, uh, my studies underway and I work with TSRO and they're doing just that how they're working with scientists to get their therapeutics out into the real world by um, commercialization so all right well thank you everyone for joining tonight we do absolutely um, appreciate your time uh, and the sacrifice that you're making. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with our icebreaker for tonight. So please use the poll feature. And the question for tonight is what has been the increase in STEM employment from 1990 to 2020? What percent do we believe has been the increase over the last 30 years? Uh, the numbers are coming in. 63 is in first place. 57. All right. A lot of participation. Thank you, guys. We'll give it just a few more seconds, and I think we'll have everybody has voted. And... Looks like 63% has been the one that was selected uh, number one. And the answer, drum roll, is 79%. Sorry. 
uh, only 12% of our students selected 79%, but this is an amazing stat. Um, this is important and we, we wanted to share this tonight because uh, many times STEM students, uh, we know uh, it's some of the most challenging degrees, some of the most challenging research, the challenging careers, and it can be discouraging, right? And I want you guys to know tonight that you're in a degree field, you're in a career field that is just growing, 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 growing. I mean, we've gone from 9 million or 17 million STEM careers in the, in the state. So absolutely amazing uh, selection that you made and we just wanna uh, teach you more about it tonight. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And Deb, we should be able to see just our panelists and all of our students now. That's what your screen should show. And we're gonna get started with our first question for tonight. And students, please put questions in the Q&A feature. You can also put questions in the chat feature, uh, but I'll get started with, uh, with one question for our panelists tonight. So uh, we'll use a, a simple one for you just to kind of warm you up. Um, we always like to talk about things that we've learned in our careers. And if we had a chance to do things over, do things again. So with what you've experienced at this point in your career, what is one or two things that you would do different or that you wish you knew at the start in that planning phase? One or two things you would do different or that you wish you knew? Um, let's see, let's, let's start with you, Dr. Esquivel. Yeah, that's a good question. I think <clears throat> the first thing I would say was um, to not be scared of asking for help. Uh, grad school was really hard for me. I felt like I didn't belong and that I was going to get found out real quick that they let me in. They let the wrong Jessica in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anytime I had any sort of question or issue with the material, I went in a little hole and I tried to figure out by myself. So that caused, you know, a lot of overnighters, that caused a lot of tears, that caused a lot of gray hair, that's why I color it. <laughs> um, so I think if I were to do it over again, I would just ask questions and, you know, try and battle through that imposter syndrome and understand that like everybody is going through what I was going through with regards to the material um, and just find people that could help you get through it. So. Dr. Esquivel, does it, um, is it basically the same kind of learning and I guess fears or insecurities that you had to come, overcome with that in your academics and at the beginning of the career? Uh, did you have some of those same fears even when you actually started doing the work? Yeah, so academically, for sure, in grad school, I had those fears. Um, starting my postdoc, so I'm still kind of in academia. We're always okay. learning. Um, so starting my postdoc, I went from being an expert in neutrinos, and we can talk about what neutrinos are, you know, later on, to going on to an experiment where I had, like, literally no idea what was going on. Um, so I did go through that process again of feeling like, Oh, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm, you know, ready for this. I don't know if I'm set up for, for success. Um, but I think learning about imposter syndrome and having language um, to kind of describe the feelings that I was going through really did help the transitioning process from being an expert in graduate, at the end of graduate school to being a novice again with regards to my postdoc and really just leaning into this is going to be a process. And that's what science, that's what physics is, is just really leaning into that process and asking questions and building up that skill set. Okay. Paul, what are your thoughts? Uh, so a couple things. Uh, one thing is I thought when I get into college, when I graduate, I'm going to know everything about being a chemical engineer. I'm going to be set. Everything's going to be good. I'll be an expert. Um, that was wrong. Um, the other thing was 
uh, to go back and tell myself that you're not necessarily going to be the expert. It's, kind of, it's actually going to be the beginning. The other thing is that an engineer, someone in STEM, can it can look a lot of different ways. Like even from our panelists here, we're all in different fields. So when I was coming in as a chemical engineer, I thought, okay, I have chemical in my name. Obviously, I'm going to be doing stuff with chemicals all the time. But then I, I followed my passions and I ended up um, more on a continuous improvement side. Um, I'm really enjoying it. So if I could go back, I think it would uh, would help myself to not stress out about, okay, what, uh, what I'm trying to do as far as uh, trying to make it seem more science or engineering related, but just, just do what um, I enjoy. And I can apply a lot of the stuff I learned as an engineer in a lot of different places. Actually, a lot of people on my team have the same degree as me. Uh, but when I was going through college, I didn't realize that that was a path for me. Hmm. So you thought a chemical engineer would kind of put you in a certain box. Yeah. But you realized that being a chemical engineer or just being an engineer in general, mm -hmm. there were so many doors that, that, you know, that you can open and different career paths that would lead to. Yeah. So if you knew that you had many more options and all that, you know, as you were preparing for your career, what, what are some of the things that you think you would have done different and something a student can think about or do now um, if they did know they had a lot of career options with inside of their degree choices? Yeah, I think I would uh, maybe branched out a little bit more as far as different opportunities I, I looked at. Um, at least as far as uh, my background, I, I, I had the opportunity to do um, research with LSAP and Inspire as well as some of the in industry stuff. It kind of took me a little bit more to get to the industry side because I was doing more of the research side. Uh, but really after seeing the two, I know, I feel like I'm, I'm still on my path. I'm still working towards my goals as far as doing more stuff towards uh, research and development side and working with continuous improvement on that end. But I think earlier on, if I had been more open, it would have been less stressful for me. Um, I think it was more of a mindset than um, what opportunities were available. Okay, thank you for that, Paul. Um, Dr. Pierce, what are your thoughts on what you know now that you've experienced a little bit? Uh, the the 21-year-old the Dr. Pierce, the 22-year-old Dr. Pierce, talk to her. Um, I would, I, I kind of really, it re really resonated with me what Jessica said about, you know, you feel like you're, you're out of place and um, sometimes that imposter syndrome can come up and show its head very, like in unexpected ways. Um, I would, I would say to my younger self that, you know, when you're looking at other people and other, uh, either other students or maybe students ahead of you or even your professors um, know that it's a, it's a winding road. Like people branch out; they don't they don't necessarily set out from undergrad or even graduate school knowing exactly what career they want to go. They kind of follow. Um, like I, I kind of like this, and let me try this, and um, well, that job didn't work out, so let me do something else. And it's never a straight shot, and that and that's okay. Um, and you know, the the story kind of or the journey kind of brings in what you think are our failures. Um, I had one of my uh, mentors in graduate school look me in the eye and said, um, I don't think research is for you. <laughs> and you know, you can't internalize, <laughs> you know, if, if you if you go through some types of um, some types of experiences, um, know that if you if you fail, or if you come up short, or if you're still working, or it takes you a little while to catch up on or, or maybe that's just not your strength in general. It's not personal. It's a process. It's you're you're learning. You're 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 able to um, just kind of take those experiences and build on top of it, and uh, just kind of being able to to share um, with just colleagues along the way, just different personal struggles. Um, I learned that hardly anybody has it all figured out, and you know, just the process isn't you personally. It's, it's your journey through um, your career and your professionalism. And, and just because you fail, you're not a failure. It's just, you know, your people learn at different rates. Um, and that kind of helps to, to take off the, the like, oh, I don't, 
I don't know if this this is for me or this this table is not for me or you know they seem to have it all together. People fail stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I um I think that's a that's a very powerful statement there because um we think and I don't know why we think that way, but it's just natural for us as we're young. We really believe that those that are our managers, those that are professional professors, that they are just perfect. Um, and there is a lot of imperfection. <laughs> There's a lot of imperfection in your career. Um, and something that I learned that I believe it's, it's just about those that have stay in power. And I think yep. Dr. Esquivel hit it, those that are continuous learners that just mm -hmm. commit to education, even though we call it career, uh, we're committing to some yeah. form of continuous education. So, so let's go a little deeper. We have a student that's asked us um, a challenging question, and I'm gonna help shape this a bit um, into a more challenging question for our panelists tonight, uh, because I think this has helped our students. So in the, the, the realm of, um, what do we call it, imposter syndrome, so let's take it to a different spot with imposter syndrome, not just the technical skills, but let's talk about when you're thinking about a career and you're thinking about the environments that you're going to be going in and who you're surrounded by. And maybe we're not all surrounded by that type of demographic in our upbringing and our education. How did you overcome like, man, everybody does not look like me. They do not maybe read the books I read, watch the movies I read, listen to the music I read, go to places I go to. How do you learn how to, you know, get through that imposter syndrome of if you even belong there culturally beyond just academically? Anybody can step in on that. I know that's a challenging one, but I know that's one that those are some of the confidence boosters that our students need to continue to stay in on their paths. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's super <laughs> relevant right now. Like, Absolutely. Super relevant. <laughs> super relevant. <laughs> um, it's definitely a process. Uh, I'm just going to throw some, some stats out, right? So I'm in physics. There are uh, about 150 Black women with a PhD in physics in the country ever. Oh, wow. And that oh. is... Yeah, yeah, that's all encompassing. So that is women that are doing, black women that are doing physics, but didn't have the opportunity to get their PhD, but they're at our level. So I think this year we're technically gonna hit 100, um, but I like to do the, the whole 150 because there was a lot of systemic, you know, barriers that were put, that are still in place that didn't allow those women that are still doing physics to actually get that, that credential, right? So let's start there. Um, I'm the second woman to get a PhD from Syracuse University. I was the only black, black woman. I was the only black woman in my uh, cohort. Um, and I was one of three women in general in the department while I was going through. So when we talk about like imposter syndrome, we do talk academically. I don't think I'm smart enough, but also you look around and the spaces were not created for people that look like me, right? So the way they teach wasn't, I wasn't in, in mind when they built up curriculum. Um, the examples that they use are misogynistic, <laughs> let's just be honest, right? When we're dealing with, you know, statistics and my professor brings up sperm to talk about it and then come calls me out and says, oh, but you wouldn't know anything about that. When I know stats, maybe I don't have, you know, the genitals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, these are the types of things um, that push good scientists smart people out of the field. Um, so I think you hit it right, the nail on the head, is that there is an added layer to imposter syndrome that, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color have to deal with that our white counterparts 
don't. Everybody goes into STEM knowing it's going to be hard. Everybody has that imposter syndrome to a certain extent, but we also have to combat the structural mm -hmm. barriers on top of that. So, so Dr. Esquivel, you, you are a good, you are a great scientist. You are a great researcher. So how did you not allow, because you said, you know, some of these barriers can push away good scientists before they truly, um, you know, blossom into the scientists that they were destined to be. What allowed you to not give up and you're still doing it right now? Yeah, um, I had a really good sponsor in undergrad and I like to highlight the difference between mentors and sponsors. Both Absolutely. are necessary, you know, in this process, uh, but sponsors stick their neck out for you. Sponsors put their name on the line to move your career forward. And I had an amazing sponsor in undergrad. His name was Dr. Richard Cardenas and actually got a medal from Barack Obama for all the work he did. Um, so he's a really, really awesome sponsor. And he was making money moves with regards to my career. He made sure that I was going to, in, you know, internships as a uh, summer out of my freshman year through the McNair program. Uh, so I could build up those skills. He was connecting with, you know, uh, professors that he knew up in Columbia to get me another internship with regards to uh, particle physics. So he was, you know, really making sure that I was getting connected at, at quote unquote, a young age in, in my career. So when I went to graduate school and I was the only, I knew I had the skills to be an awesome researcher because Dr. Cardenas showed me that I could do that and put me in positions where I could flourish. Um, so when professors were throwing out microaggressions left and right, I was sitting back knowing I just got to get through this class. Mm -hmm. I just got to get through this class and I can do the physics. I could do the research. I could do the fun stuff. But I'm going to be honest, I almost quit. And it wasn't until I it's found bad. out mm -hmm. that there are only 150 Black women with a PhD in physics that I was like, all right this is not just about me. Like I got to forge the path for other people. Um, so I'm a stubborn, <laughs> I'm a stubborn woman. Uh, when somebody tells me that, oh, you can't do it or it can't be done or there's no way that you can do it. My answer is, Vas a ver, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dr. Pierce, you know, kind of continue on that. What are, what are some of your experiences with that? And, um, and, and how are you pressed forward? And is it real? Um, like, have you, is it real to you? It, it definitely is real. Um, when, you know, when people start talking about networking and, you know, you, you kind of have a, a colleague that has, has, a, has a friend of the family that can introduce you to like some other job uh, opportunity, you can kind of see the disconnect <laughs> and, you know, who, who can I call on in, in that counterpart um, space? And um, I really, what I, what I really um, linked on was people who was with me in the beginning. So McNair, McNair scholars and people who kind of joined the journey with me, who look more like me, um, and then keep, keep in touch with them because you guys will be doing great things five years from now, six years from now, seven years from now, and hopefully the, the professional field looks a little bit different, but um, programs like, you know, uh, the summer, summer research programs and um, even getting into my graduate program, uh, I really made it a point to reach out to, um, we had uh, cultural diversity type of organizations that weren't even weren't just in my school but in the neighboring school so at Vanderbilt Nashville is actually um, home to a number of HBCUs and people who are who are striving to um, uh, further themselves in the STEM education and engineering and things like that but you might have to expand your network just a little bit to include not just the people uh, in your own department but I found out that a lot of um, uh, 
through other types of like ACDR, which is like advancing cultural diversity and research and um, like the, the black MBA chapters or uh, other types of professional organizations where they they might also be experienced that um, they're the only one or, you know, they're, they're feeling like, oh my gosh, if we, if I could just get, get a couple of us together in this room and commiser commiserate our experience, I could, you have some type of a support. You might just have to be a little bit more proactive in your support system and be, being very intentional about, you know, connecting with other, other types of profession professionals. Because um, it might not just be right in your lab or right, right next door or, or right down the hall. Um, you, have, you might have to just reach out. I had to reach out a lot because uh, you do need it. You absolutely need it. You need to be able to, to talk to somebody else and be like, okay, this is what happened. Am I crazy or, <laughs> but um, you have to you just kind of have to be just a little bit more intentional about building your network around that. So um, uh, it, this is interesting. And I, I want to do just a unplanned poll um, with our panelists here and, and I'll, I'll do an unplanned poll with myself. Paul, are you still there? Oh, <laughs> is that him coming back as soon as I say that? Paul, is that you returning, sir? Oh, uh, we lost Yes, though. he's reconnecting. Okay. So what I wanted to do, and I'll just do this with our, with our two panelists here. Um, raise your hand and I'll join you. If there has been a moment in your career or in your academic process where you said, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Where you truly felt like I do not want to do this anymore. Has you, have you had that moment of question or even where you even had to question it? Not that you like quit, but you like, you know what? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I need to, we need to call somebody right now. Exactly, I need yes. to talk to somebody. And I think that's important because our students, if I poll the students right now, and we can do a quick, a quick poll, um, students ra use the raise your hand feature. If you've had a moment just so far in your academics, even if you haven't had a career that started yet, just in your academic career, that you felt like, why am I doing this? Like, is this really something I should be doing? And there are um, lots of hands <laughs> being raised right now. So I'm bringing that up to say this, right? This is not doom and gloom. I want you to know that you're not alone mm -hmm. and that you're normal because it can make you feel abnormal. Like STEM is already a space where we're kind of come, we're already like in a niche. And then you feel like your degree field is a niche. And then you feel like I want to give up or quit. That's a niche. And he's like, man, you can really feel alone. It feels really lonely. And don't, and maybe people don't understand. And that's why I really love what Dr. Pierce said. Call somebody. You need to develop a friend, a mentor, a somebody mm -hmm. that you can literally say what's on your heart to. Unfiltered what your heart feels because that person is the person that is truly going to tell you. And for me, sad to say, because I didn't have the network at the time early in my career, mine was my mother. She literally said, get your butt back in there. <laughs> get your butt. And that was all I needed it was for her to say, stop crying and get back in there. And yes, I was a grown man. I cried in my career. It, it happens. Uh, but I... <laughs> Yes, thank you. You would say Dr. Pierce is real. Yeah, it'll happen. <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> but, you know, it's important that you find those people. And I think uh, Deb set the, 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 the topics up very well. We talked about networking here recently. It's important not only to network to try to get, you know, good connections and maybe some promotional opportunities and some cool opportunities in your career that maybe you couldn't get. But sometimes you network just to have somebody to talk to that understands. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's that's very valuable. So, Paul, I know you had a little technical difficulty there. You oh, come I on in and talk to us about, you know, maybe some of the challenges that you face. You you get to travel and go to many different locations, mm -hmm. uh, many rural cities, all those type of things. So how have you overcome some of those challenges? And um, it didn't make you want to give up. You know, you, you can't you continue to press forward. 
Yeah, I think, so sorry, I, I missed what Dr. Pierce, what you said, but I got part of it from what uh, Brian was saying so with some Wi-Fi issues. But I think that the key thing really is, is that network, that connection. So even if I'm, usually when I'm traveling, I'm not just traveling by myself. So I'm traveling with another coworker or uh, at least one other coworker. So even if I can't connect with necessary people in the city, I try as much as possible to connect with coworkers or uh, connect with friends. So I think it's imperative to have those networks, people that you can reach out to when you're feeling like there's no one around that looks like you really understands what's going on. And that really starts with like all of you guys here on this call as far as um, LSMRC or in different LSAMPs uh, to keep those connections and keep um, in contact with those people. I can definitely say that uh, some of my closest friends I met while I was in Inspire and I was say, and I still in contact with them right to this day and even from other institutions. So in conferences or just chance meetings. So uh, yeah. at, at the moment when you're meeting them, you might not realize that, that you're gonna have a friend for, at least there's some people when I joined Inspire in 2014 that I, I still talk to at least every month. So uh, it's pretty powerful. I think it definitely keeps you going because a lot of times, especially with work, with travel, um, I don't really have a typical routine when I'm traveling. So a lot of things are different, uh, but at least uh, with some of the stuff I get to do with some of the alumni is some sort of routine. I get to connect with them on a monthly basis. So that's been great and that's been helpful. And it keeps me energized, it keeps me fuel, especially doing stuff like this, uh, connecting with students and connecting with other panelists as well is stuff that keeps me motivated and going. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. So Dr. Esquivel, what, this is a, a question from one of our students here. You know, with all of the degree options that you had, um, how did you narrow down your field of study? I wanted to be an astrophysicist when I was like five. <laughs> okay. Um, I watched a whole bunch of sci-fi movies and, you know, those really bad uh, TV shows with very low budgets. <laughs> um, I used to watch that all the time with my aunt. And in one of those uh, shows or movies, there was an astronaut in space fighting aliens. And I was too chicken to want to be that. But then there was this like real witty, you know, cool astrophysicist at NASA with the, you know, funny t-shirts and the little monitos on his desk. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I could do that. That doesn't look like a real job. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when I got older, my family took me to NASA and actually showed me what astrophysicists did. And I was bored because um, there was no like aliens on the screens with an astronaut <laughs> fighting. It was just like people drinking coffee and looking at numbers on the, on the screen. They were working. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is not a cartoon. I thought it was no, a cartoon. It's a real job. I don't want it. <laughs> but they, at that same time, they showed me what engineers were doing. Um, and they had this huge pool with a spaceship underwater and the engineers are like teaching the astronauts, you know, zero gravity and how to navigate, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that sensation. And I was like, okay, this looks fun. I, I like pools, I could do this. So I went to undergrad to get my electrical engineering degree um, and then took my first physics course and fell in love and like it was full circle. So even though I'm not an astrophysicist, I study particles and I'm pretty adjacent to it. So I'm a particle physicist. Um, so essentially that thread was always in my life. It was always math and science or science related. Uh, it wasn't until college though that I realized you could actually get paid to do physics, right? Um, and it wasn't until college that I realized they'll pay you to go to school right? Like, I didn't know that. <laughs> so it took, you know, a conversation that I needed to have with my mom, because she didn't want me to be a perpetual student, even though I thought that would be like the greatest job. Yeah. Um, but it, it was always kind of that for me. Now so, that I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. So I was just gonna say, is it safe to say that if I just package that under exposure? So even if it's 
getting the exposure while you're in college uh, for some, like for you, you got it at a younger age, but is it safe to say just getting some exposure either through your family taking you places or research or internships, that exposure can help dial that in for somebody that's kind of thinking about different things? Yeah, for sure. I would, I would kind of uh, expand on that and say representation is super important. And that's what I'm focusing on now as an if then ambassador through the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences is to push on representation, have people that look like me say that they're a scientist so that it becomes accessible for you know, black indigenous people of color to see themselves in this field. So that would be like my first thing. And then my second thing was would be internships, right? So during college, I did an internship for um, Northrop Grumman that turned into like a full uh, part-time job throughout my, my college career, but I was doing optical radiation physics there. So playing with lasers and okay. eyes. So that's completely different than particle physics, right? But then, like I said, my sponsor wanted to expose me to different types of physics because it's a huge umbrella. So yeah, during yeah. the summer, I went and did particle physics. I actually worked on an experiment called Microboon, um, and it's here at Fermilab. Um, and when I started working on it as a college student, it was a CAD drawing. And now wow. it's been taking data since October of 2015. So it's super cool that I was able to be on an experiment from beginning to completion and data taking um, and being able to compare that, studying the, the mysteries of the universe, right? And then also playing with lasers and compare to figure out which one I like more, uh, the mysteries of the universe won out. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. So as we, we reiterated in, in, in earlier uh, weeks, exposure, 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 it matters because it helps you understand what you like and what you don't like. Exactly. Um, and it's so important that you get both sides of the equation there. So, so Dr. Pierce, here's a question from one of our students. How did you transition from academia into industry and what are some of those you know challenges that may have come with making that that you know we'll call it college to to career uh transition um i love this question uh so when i was maybe in my third or fourth year a little late late in my third year in my phd program um i needed I needed a distraction. <laughs> Basically, I was supposed to be writing my my thesis and you know doing some uh, experiments. Obviously, you know, PhD student, but I kept coming back to like there has to be something right outside the lab. And it was just around the time where where um, we got these statistics saying you know not all the PhD students are going to get into academia, and you know you have to start broadening broadening your training. But your but our training programs didn't reflect that yet. So um, when I was uh, in my fourth year, I always, I always wanted to audit like business classes and management classes. So as a grad student, I audited a lot of undergrad classes that was in our engineering department um, that taught me more like, this is what program managers do with technologies. So once the scientists have figured out what they need to do, you actually have this interdisciplinary team that helps move it along and outside the lab and into the real world. And that was a whole different language, if you will, um, a, a different type of skill set to, to be, you know, um, be basically good at, good at those types of positions. You have to learn a little bit more management. You have to be able to kind of speak the la language of the finance department or the marketing department and, you know, regulatory types of things. And I just did not get that in my PhD program. So I went out and audited a couple of classes uh, because I, at the time I thought I wanted to be a consultant, uh, like a business consultant in, in, the, um, in the biomedical field. Uh, so it kind of made sense. And at that time, our, it, the, MBA, the joint MBA program wasn't a thing. So um, with these different types of capstone, um, uh, undergraduate programs, I was able to actually work with other life science small businesses in the Nashville area on very small 
projects, like almost like a consultant for for the semester or internship or things like that. Um, and that kind of helped build that, uh, hey, you, this, is, this is how you put in a report for stakeholders, or this is how you approach a CEO of a company, or even if it's a small company and they're still in that biomedical space, these are what they're looking at when they think about design um, of their technology or, or advancing their project. Um, and so that, that was really key for me, just kind of um, taking maybe a little under the radar. I, I don't think I told a lot of people <laughs> that I was kind of auditing these other class in addition to taking or doing my PhD, because at the time, you know, the industry and the dark side, it was kind of like the same for whatever reason. Um, so it, it was, it was, but it was those types of experience that kind of shaped um, just, just the foundational interest in what, what I could do as far as if I didn't want to stay in the lab um, and go out to an industry position, that's, these are the kind of steps and these are the type of tools that you need in your tool belt. Um, so um, I audited a couple of classes. I ended up getting, um, getting into a postdoc position for a, comp uh, a scientist, Andre Bachman at Michigan State University, who actually wanted to start up a small business. Um, but not leave his tenure faculty position. But um, so I was a project management for him, manager for him, bringing that same expertise, like, okay, this is what a marketing plan looks like. This is what, you know, if, if you want to talk to investors, this is what they're going to ask about. Um, so those, those different classes kind of help at least form some type of plan. So I could say, if you, if you don't want to start a company, let's try this, or maybe we could look into these types of grants, or maybe we could do these types of things. Um, and, and that kind of helped transition. So my postdoc wasn't just academic, it was more uh, industry focused or business development focus. That kind of, that helped a lot transition to the job that I have now where it's, it's still in academia, but it's, it's mostly all business development. Um, so yeah, just kind of being, uh, um, being able to bring in some extra or outside extracurricular type of passions around business into my personal training uh, helps help that. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to tie that into into a question for you too, Paul. So you're a chemical engineer. You had the option of maybe doing more research, taking the PhD path. Uh, you took uh, step one for you was going straight into industry. So talk to me about what led you to make that choice. Um, and do you still, though you're, you're early in your career as a chemical engineer, do you, though you with industry first, do you still have thoughts about uh, advanced degrees in chemical engineering or other STEM fields? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think to answer the second question, but I think I do still have some thoughts about advanced degrees, um, more so how it ties into where I want to go with in my career. So how I got to even decide to go into industry is kind of interesting. So as far as my undergrad, I did um, undergrad research all four years. I did um, an internship uh, through Inspire LSAM um, in 2014. And so I've had a lot of experience with research side and I really enjoy it. I, I love being around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about. But at the same time, I, it was a thought in my mind about, um, I'm an engineer and a lot of engineers go more the industrial route, but I've only been doing stuff in research. So I don't really know what that other side looks like. So just uh, kind of like we talked about just exploring other opportunities. I decided to start applying for um, industry type opportunities. So I was able to land a co-op with Cargill, which is uh, more like a large scale industrial type, like soybean refinery, which is not even close to the stuff I'm doing now. Um, but I, I saw some positives. I saw some stuff I didn't like. I was like, I don't know about like the large scale type of things. So I just, um, well, being a little bit transparent as far as the Cargill opportunity after I finished the co-op, um, usually they offer you an internship afterwards. And I was told that I wouldn't be getting an internship. I was um, recommended, but not highly recommended. Um, so they didn't make me an offer. So that was really the, 
not the first time, but the first major time I was being rejected by industry. So that really it forced me out of my comfort zone to say, okay, uh, maybe cargo is not going to work out. But so it forced me to look elsewhere at other companies. So I can look at other companies that are similar, but um, me being passionate about food. So I love to eat. Uh, some people eat to live. I definitely live to eat. Um, so I was like, okay, I love food. So why not do something on the food side of things? I started to look at different companies and some, one of my friends told me about Nestle having an internship. You can apply online. I was like, apply online. I was like, there's, there's no way that's going to work out. Like it's not a career for not me and someone in person. How am I going to apply online? But I, I did it anyway. Uh, unfortunately, I got some help my resume. I was able to get ex uh, experience as a Nestle intern. And I really enjoyed it. I, uh, when, when I got there, it was a uh, Stouffer's and Lee Cuisine. So we got like the frozen Stouffer's and Lee Cuisine uh, foods. That was the type of factory I was in. And that I knew that that was the kind of environment I wanted to be around. More to finish products, so more to see like um, impact made it became a factory. I'm seeing it out there in stores. I can be proud of, of a company that I could say, hey, I, I was a part of making that. So that's something that really drove me. Uh, and then at the same time, second time uh, after going to the internship, usually all the interns get an offer for full time. Um, they cut down on the internship and they're 40 interns, they only offered to 20 of them. And I was one of the 20 that didn't get an offer. So I had to, uh, again, look at other opportunities. So at the time, it was definitely a disappointment, but it forced me on my comfort zone. It forced me to look beyond and do something different, which looking back, I'm thankful for. And I'll, I'll skip forward to as far as the transition now, um, having those different opportunities and having to look at things differently and do things differently definitely helped um, when I came to choose industry, because I, I was able to figure out what type of industry I like versus what I didn't like, or the positives of um, doing research versus not doing research. And I, I'll say right now, I haven't given up on doing research. I still think I, uh, Nestle, uh, so I work for Nestle Purina or Nestle as a whole is one of the largest leaders as far as uh, research and development for in the food industry. So that was a, a big reason why I wanted to work for Nestle or I have worked for Nestle. So as far as what I'm doing right now, continuous imp improvement, I'm really enjoying it. But it's really uh, building my, my skill set as far as what I want to do with, with uh, research and development, really knowing more about the industry, knowing how the machine works, the, the, the people work. So that's just bolstering my resume so I can make the step to where I want to go. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. So here's another question that came in, and I'm thinking – Dr. Esquivel, I'd like for you to kind of to, to try to take. Did he? This one. So. Okay, there you are. The question <laughs> says, and um, if I don't. You're breaking up You're a little bit, up. Brian. Yeah. I thought it was me again. I got nervous. I know. <laughs> and ask the question the way in which you intended. Oh better yes brian we missed the question could you begin with the question better again? yes that's oh, much better. okay yeah that was kind of weird um so uh justice <laughs> if you uh, if you know if you take your from your question incorrectly justice um but i wanted dr esquivel to to try to tackle this one so how did you get over the anxiety of going Going so, into a virtually unexplored, non-traditional field. So I'm sure if you went, oh, sorry. Did, so did we're, you hear that we're answering Esquivel? Justice's question. You keep coming in and out, but yes, I can see it on my screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if this one was for me, but I can answer how I think it was. I can, I can answer how I, what I think <laughs> she's asking. Um, so Justice asks us, well, how do you get over anxiety of going into in a virtually unexplored, non-traditional field? And Dr. Esquivel, we were kind of tossing that to you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess the way I get over the anxiety is with the excitement of studying something that nobody else has studied before. Um, 
as a particle physicist, we're not trying to build anything or um, create a finished product. We're literally studying mysteries of the universe um, and asking big questions like, you know, what are we made up of? What are the fundamental building, block, building blocks of the universe? Um, what is going on in the cosmos with dark matter and dark energy? We still don't know that one. <laughs> what are pesky particles uh, like neutrinos floating around? Um, why are they here? Uh, and I think the, the draw of the unknown is just so exciting that that anxiety goes out the window. Um, it, that's not to say that you still don't have to like go through it. Uh, for my graduate work, I actually really pushed my advisor to let me use machine learning in particle physics, uh, which we're like on, we're about 10, 15 years uh, behind computer scientists using machine learning. But it could really help to answer those, you know, really interesting questions. So I pushed and pushed and pushed saying, come on, let's, let's do, let's use some convolutional neural nets. Let's do some image processing. It could be real cool. <laughs> um, and then he finally said yes. And I realized, whoa, I'm not a computer scientist. <laughs> And then the anxiety creeps in and I start thinking, ah, I really shouldn't have pushed so hard. I should have done something easier. You know, I should have taken the traditional route like all my other particle physics friends and just done data analysis the way it's been done for, you know, decades. Uh, but it was exciting, right? <laughs> uh, and thankfully, I was able to figure it out and push through. Um, but it's, it's just that excitement of nobody's done it like this before or nobody's studied this before or, you know, nobody even knows the answers to the questions we're asking. Uh, that's how I get over it. <laughs> well, it looks like Brian's frozen again. Would either Paul or Dr. Thank Pierce, you, uh, would either one of you like to also kind of talk to that? Oh, as far as um, a career that's not usually explored? Yeah, how do you get over those that anxiety of being part of that group? <laughs> it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Pierce may have been one that is... Can you hear me, Dr. Pierce? Yes, yep, I can hear you. <laughs> so have um, you... If, have you um, Kind of talk about it for maybe a little bit on your of your career, your academia, and the kind of the entrepreneurial aspect. How you're kind of that's not a typical path to do all three of those things. And how have you kind of navigated your way through the academia, the career, and you know somewhat of entrepreneurship endeavors as well? Um, I think. I think what's really helped me is um, being able to um, just kind of connect with people who have gone a different route. Uh, so while I was, you know, in graduate school, I was connected with the business students. And, you know, how, how are you guys thinking about uh, your job? What are you, what are you guys doing? Because they're not teaching that over in my PhD training. Um, so what, what are some insights that you guys have or um, when it comes to, you know, starting up my own company or being an entrepreneur, just people who are um, either doing it themselves or in the thought leader space that not, is not necessarily part of the thought leadership that's, that's in my discipline. Um, just kind of really taking an interest to, um, uh, especially in, our, in the entrepreneur scene, you know, small businesses or, or people who have just kind of gone just gone those alternate alternate ways and kind of connect with either people via, via mastermind groups or really making it making an attempt to at conferences just kind of people who are just thinking about things totally different than I am and just kind of um, I really enjoy the the trying to connect the two I, I really like you know what's what's connecting us between um, 
you know, this, the scientist who has some therapy they're trying to work on in cancer versus this entrepreneur who is trying to get this medical device out. Like what, what's, what's the connecting language that we, that we need to um, uh, just kind of explore there. I think, and usually the unexplored areas are, are in the connections, kind of just like what Jessica said, you know, if you look into the uh, computer science um, industry, you listen to their thought leaders and where their field is going, you can bring that back to your own field and say, yeah, we, we could definitely use this type, this type of technology. We could use this type of um, design thinking, if you will, to apply to our work. And I think it's, I think that's kind of what helps um, uh, either explore those, un, those unexplored areas, those connections with other people and other ideas, and just kind of being able to to take off your expert hat and be like, okay, I'm, I'm a baby learner in this area. What can, you, what can you teach me? And then kind of bringing it back to your team and saying, you know, let's try this thing. Uh, I really like what Jessica said about that. It's, it's, it's true for um, any uh, plus career if you want. So I have science plus business, but it's true for science plus politics or science plus graphic design. It's really just looking at, you know, the, the thought leaders that are in something that's opposite or uh, complementary to your field and asking, not being afraid to ask the baby questions. <laughs> Thank you. Brian, you froze up again. What about anybody else? Does anybody else in the audience have a question they'd like to ask? Go ahead yeah. and take yourself so, off of mute. What are some of the, you cannot hear me. Can't hear me, Dale. Brian, you keep breaking up. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a couple people with their hands raised. Let's see here. Who would like to ask their question? All right, Siva, would you like to go first? Go ahead and take yourself uh, off of mute. Hey, hi. Um, I Ooh. was wondering if any can of. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, cool. I was wondering if any of the extracurriculars you guys did in undergrad helped you get actual jobs, like jobs out of college. Anybody want to go ahead and take that? I, if it, I can jump in. Go ahead, Dr. Escobar. <laughs> okay. Um, so the University that I went to for undergrad, uh, I talked about my sponsor. He was really into science communication and bringing science to underserved communities. Um, so throughout my whole college career, we ho hosted this event called Fiesta Physics. And it was two times a year. And it was this big old party. And we do awesome physics demonstrations and bring you know middle schoolers that were adjacent to, to our university to the universities so they could see physicists that you know look like me represent representation matters but then also be on campus right and see that they can come you know to a university like that uh and i didn't i didn't realize how much i had connected physics with community engagement um until i was in graduate school and, you know, people were telling me, you got to have your nose to the books. Don't be wasting time on that. Uh, and I was so unfulfilled. And it wasn't until I moved back to Chicago. I'm not back to Chicago. I'm already trying to say I'm a Chicagoan, but I know I'm not. <laughs> it wasn't until I moved to Chicago and was doing full on research that I leaned back into science communication and community engagement uh, and realized that that is my passion just as much as physics is. Um, and while I don't do that full time, I get a lot of um, a lot of asks in my in my email inbox to to be on panels like this, um, to do keynotes, uh, to you know talk on why I think representation matters, um, and they're paid gigs, right? So even though it's not like a job. Um, it's definitely uh, giving me some extra cash flow, and it's something that I that I really love to do, um, and that has helped me move up as a leader um, at Fermilab, 
with regards to you know equity diversity and inclusion with regards to restructuring our education office um, to focus on the growth model and not the deficit model, to look critically at the marketing uh, and advertising materials that we have coming out of the communications office to make sure that they are diverse and equitable. Uh, so it, it's all connected, right? And um, for me, it's really important that we not only focus on the cool science, but also focus on how do we get my space, you know, my physics society to start looking like society as a whole. So that, that's a huge, huge passion for me. And it, they're finally paying me <laughs> for doing that work. Nothing wrong with that, is it? All right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even be on this panel if it wasn't for Marie, who I met in when I was an undergrad. Um, hi, Marie. <laughs> uh, you know, wow. just be able to. Um, and I mean, I, I looked at the McNair program as, you know, um, I wanted to do research, but basically they were paying three thousand dollars for the summer. I was like, OK, let's let's get in there. Um, so it was it was kind of um, an extracurricular activity that just kept just coming back, like you, the, the workshops that we talked, that we had, and um, just like webinars like this, where you get to hear just, just different possibilities. And um, we actually had a um, supplemental workshop where it was, you know, how, how do you write a grant? I first learned how to write a grant in, or we knew what a grant was in McNair as an undergrad. And, um, you know, just having that confidence to talk to my graduate professors and mentors about, you know, I did, you know, I do remember this overarching concept that used to come up in my McNair class all the time and that it kind of helps build your confidence when you're, when you're saying, you know, these types of extracurricular activities, particularly McNair, has been able to, to impact every step of the career. So in graduate school and then um, being able to kind of, um, be in panels like this because this does help your career, not only, you know, the leadership, Absolutely. but also it's just so good to see you like, well, I can't see you guys, but <laughs> but talk to you guys because it just keeps you grounded. It's like this is this is what we're this is why we're doing what we want to do. And you know, um the, the the next generation, if you will, or just the, the colleagues that are just a little bit younger than us, you know, there's there's people who who want to be part of that that family and so even just being here helps <laughs> with the career and i wouldn't have been able to do that had i you know not even been in mcnair um as undergraduate so um yes they absolutely help <laughs> yeah i'll definitely echo what dr pierce and dr Sivel said about uh, extracurricular activities i wouldn't be on this panel either if i hadn't met deb and brian while i was in undergrad uh, so, so, oh wow! <laughs> I yeah. forgot, man. Look, you're, you're like a grown man. I forgot you were. Hey, Paul was a college student. 2014, 20. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. You're like yeah. a grown man now. <laughs> but yeah, just just chance meetings like that. I attend a com conference. I heard this guy Brian Thomas speak, and uh, we've been friends talking to him ever since then. But it, even besides. Um, um, LSAM beyond that if there's other organizations like I know me personally uh, being part of the National Society of Black Engineers um, and then in an undergrad I haven't been as much um, involved in now but in undergrad I was involved in the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and even myself I'm not Hispanic but just that getting into that community getting to know other people who are underrepresented in STEM and in engineering going to the conferences connecting with people and even on the local side, like at my university, getting involved with the local chapter, whether it's taking leadership position, where I started off like on not a smaller position, but not as much responsibility with telecommunications, doing like uh, managing websites, or I created a Twitter for my local Nesby chapter. Um, and from there, even working with Inspire and helping to start a new club, being on uh, a that was dedicated to research and just from there just continually to uh, just push and do other things and branch out because i think a lot of, a lot of those things i 
those skills that I built doing those things apply directly with all that I'm doing now. All of that is people skills, it's leadership skills, talking skills, all of that is applicable with anything you do anywhere. And that, that's going to be really reflected on your resume as well when you're, you're applying for either um, internships or co-ops or graduate school and having those recommendations as well. All of that comes together. And you, and you never know what, um, yeah, like what um, um, Paul said, you just never know what happens. I, I just um, volunteered to do like bioscience day on the hill. That, that would con be considered an extracurricular activity as a, as a postdoc and got involved with the trade organization, uh, Mish Bio, that puts that on. Just like, hey, can I volunteer? I've never done this at all. Um, I kind of uh, never done anything with politics and just kind of asked them if I could volunteer and be a part of it. And um, got, in, got in touch with that trade organization. He, he saw um, the president um, later on had this panel where he wanted to bring in the younger generation of science that was happening in the, in the region. Um, and he provided a, a, a space for me to just kind of share the story of my postdoc and what we were doing. Somebody in the audience saw, saw that, that speech and contacted me on LinkedIn for an interview saying, hey, we would like to kind of uh, interview you for a position that's kind of along science communication, business development, just from that speak. And I speech and I work for them right now, like TSRL. Oh. So oh, it's oh, wow. like, you just what really just don't even don't even know where these like extracurricular, like, hey, I'm interested in this. You just never know where they go. Um, so yes, be, be involved. <laughs> I would like to, to kind of add to that and ask a question to you too. Um, um, I, I volunteered, oh my gosh, six years ago uh, with <laughs> Deb, uh, Dr. Wynn at that time, and um, on the show Quirky. And um, six years later, here we go, you know, uh, we've been in partnership for, for years now. So absolutely, I am a testament that that is uh, really critical. The other thing is, I like to ask you guys, because sometimes students don't know this side of certain things. Uh, they see our careers. They see uh, you may make money. You may get exposure. You're researching. But what is something cool to you? Might, it might not be cool to everybody else, but cool to you that you had no idea that you would get exposure to or get to do in your career um, that, you know, some, some of our students tonight can be like, man, you know, I know I'm a work. I know I might get a paycheck for working, but there's something kind of cool or, you know, unique about our careers that you just don't know until you get into them. Anybody has anything like that, um, you know, they want to share tonight? And for some people, it's just free travel. Listen, that's cool, right? <laughs> yeah, that's my first cool. international trip was for a conference. <laughs> Dude, I got to say, Paris. I was in Paris. I went, they sent me to Paris for training. They're like, Brian, do you mind going to Paris for training? Mind? When? <laughs> Why are you asking me this question? <laughs> but you, uh, panelists, please share on that. I think that may be something uh, beneficial to our students tonight. Yeah, I, I, I would totally start with travel. Uh, as physicists, as a, a particle physics, physicist, we work in collaboration, right? Um, so we move our collaboration meeting across the country uh, every, I think, three months. Last year's collaboration meeting was in Elba. It's a tiny little island off of Italy it was all inclusive. I mean, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they were asking if you want wine. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, the food was phenomenal. Lunches were on the beach. Like, come on. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, and that was not my first international, um, you know, trip because of work. Uh, two years before, I was going to a conference that is uh, for the internet, it's called the International Conference for Women in Physics. So I do a lot of work with regards to, uh, you know, checking or testing and researching the climate for 
uh, underrepresented minorities in, in physics. That one was in the UK and I got to go to Harry Potter world. So that was a Aww. lot of fun. So you get a, you know, you get a lot of perks for being a physicist um, on the adjacent side. And I think it's something that at least in my space gets overlooked is science communication. Um, that can take you to a lot of places too. And it's so much fun to do. And like I said before, once you know, you start getting good at it and people are realizing that you can communicate in so many different spaces, very complicated, you know, topics, uh, they start asking you, hey, you wanna come over here? You wanna be on this panel? You wanna do this keynote? Um, so that has been just realizing that I really like that has been has been cool and um, being an if then ambassador has you know elevated my status with regards to science communication. Um, I'm unfortunately COVID hit, but I was you know slated to go to Comic Con to talk about my science. I was at the wow. AAAS conference, which was like fourteen thousand scientists gathered together, you know, in Seattle to you know build up that skill um if then uh the if then ambassadorship is working like a talent agent mo you know model so they're hooking me up with tv shows and youtube you know uh channels um so it it really does open up doors to a whole new uh career path awesome awesome anyone else want to share um Kind of along the lines of the um, the conferences uh, in science and um, just kind of doing things that you, you just didn't think you would do. Um, a while ago, uh, science, Society for Neuroscience decided they wanted to get into the, the social media and um, Twitter sphere and ask a whole bunch of bloggers if they wanted to just kind of represent uh, some um, some of the scientists that were that were there. And so um, that was back in the day when I was like, okay, well, maybe I should try blogging and things like that. But to, to go to a conference, I think it was maybe um, 20,000 20, scientists in San Diego and be able to, to, you know, have somebody say, we care about your experience, share with us what, what you are feeling and, and seeing and experiencing at the conference, and we'll share it with everybody. Um, just in that in that social media space, as um, it was kind of cool thing because you you get to you get to vote heard. These they didn't go to people who were established and, and had been blogging for eight years. I think they did that on purpose. It was basically um, people who are just coming into the field. We want to hear you. Here's here's something to 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 express yourself creatively um, in in creative writing or you know graphic graphic design what have you. Um, I, I thought that was that was pretty cool. It was something that you know. Not only do I get a chance to go to the conference and to hear what my colleagues and my friends and people I've never heard before are doing, but to have something um, to that kind of tied into my own personal personal interests of maybe blogging or graphic design or you know just kind of creatively expressing myself and and what I think about my science journey experience. I thought that was pretty cool. Awesome! 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 I know you're traveling like crazy, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll jump on. Collecting the, those, collecting those points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the the points in to hotels, cars, all of that. <laughs> oh yeah, keeping that travel train going. I didn't realize that it's possible to have a job that travels as much as I do. So I'm slated to travel about 75% of the time. It's really about one week out of the month where I'm really supposed to be in the office, but you know, the rest of the time I'm in factories doing different trainings, coaching, things like that. Uh, but one thing I didn't realize that it would bring about was a couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to actually fly, fly on the corporate jet just for the, one of the projects that I was on. Um, so that was, that was a great experience. And then even the, one of the projects I'm on that's using um, an app and um, an iPad and all of that stuff with the social media aspect of it to drive communi communication continuous improvement which not something i even know existed before uh, so uh, between the corporate chat and that 
actually the project I'm on do using that app was one of the reasons I was able to go on there because there's other people on my team that have been with the company 10 plus years that they haven't been on the corporate chat, but just happenstance, like I got a chance to do it. So that was something I didn't expect. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty cool. I'll, I'll just go real quick for me. I, um, I had a trip, a business trip to Shanghai. Um, I was in Shanghai and I went from Shanghai to Paris on the same business trip, <laughs> uh, downtown Paris. And then like maybe 12 months later, I'm in Milan um, when Michelle Obama was there. Um, I think it was towards the end of their, uh, their presidency. And it was the World's Fair uh, was just so happened to be in Milan during that time. And so I'm in Italy, just, oh my gosh. So it's just uh, travel. Travel. Yes, travel. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and being, and keeping it real, right? We got some, some sessions in the future we're going to talk about. And we've talked about it before with some of the PhD things. You know, there's money is involved in our careers, guys. Um, we don't always talk about money, but people do make money, right? And sometimes there's a nice little perks out there and things, and there's avenues in STEM, and we'll maybe do a, a session on this. There's avenues in STEM, and I'm pretty sure the panelists will tell you, money comes in from some ways that you didn't probably know until you get into your career. Um, you speak, you write, you on podcasts, you're on all kinds of stuff. There's avenues that income comes in for STEM professionals who learn how to communicate mm -hmm. in ways beyond just their day jobs. If mm -hmm. you learn how to talk and if you learn how to write, if you can do those two things and you are uh, the bomb.com in your expertise, you will make money in ways that you didn't even know existed. Uh, opportunities are come to you that you didn't know existed. So I uh, just want you guys to be encouraged in that space as well. Um, so I'd like to do one last question before we get out of here, see if any students uh, will pop up um, one more. Actually, here's, here's a good one, guys. I apologize there. Um, this is interesting. Has COVID-19 impacted your career? Um, and then for those students out there that had their summer internships impacted? Uh, what are some things that you can say to them to encourage them to get through it? And also, you know, maybe how can they prepare themselves in the future to get internships that are beyond just uh, physically somewhere, you know, maybe on the virtual side of things. So how has it impacted you? And then just kind of a little bit of encouragement and preparedness in the future for, for something like this that may happen again. Uh, so I would say, um, so TSRL only works with um, technologies in the infectious disease space. So it's a little bit different for us. <laughs> um, you kind of just shine a light on like, hey, what are you guys doing? Where you, where, where's the answers? Come on. Uh, so it has been, um, we, it impacts our career as, as far as the different projects that we were going to bring, um, uh, maybe have a, a new new light, if you will, like what, how specifically can they uh, impact this COVID situation? Are you working on technologies where you're looking at antibodies that could help um, with the vaccine or with uh, testing or diagnostics? So um, we're in a little bit different position, um, but I will say um, I have been seeing, as uh, Brian said, there are a lot more opportunities for remote type of learning and remote type of opportunities for uh, internship. Um, um, I think just kind of being a little bit more proactive to, you know, um, almost like, almost like consulting, if you will, like the, if you, if you have projects that require some deep research or, you know, um, secondary research where you're looking up the internet, or you're trying to gather some information that would be useful to a team, you could do those types of things remote, uh, especially if you're a grad student, postdoc, um, or upper, um, undergraduate. Um, so there's, there could be some opportunities around there um, where you don't necessarily have to be in the lab, but that research, that research skill of being able to find information, synthesize it and communicate it in a way or a package that would be helpful for even smaller companies um, could, could um, bring some other types of exposure or experience um, on that sense. And 
And that takes a little bit more creativity, you know, just kind of put yourself out there or, or um, kind of team up with classes that are, you know, either have capstone um, projects where they where they are interacting with small businesses locally, but they're they're looking those small businesses are looking to um, uh, for small projects for uh, upperclassmen or, or graduate students. Those types of things can also bring bring opportunities, and you can do those remotely. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Uh, I do mostly research, so um, while I before COVID, it was probably 60-40 where I'm working in the lab versus um, doing data analysis on a computer. Um, so I've completely pivoted to just doing data analysis and, you know, data quality. Um, COVID has been tough, right? You, you, you have to, you don't get that social interaction that you are used to on a daily basis. So really checking in with yourself and your mental health and making sure that you're reaching out to people, um, that you're still trying to get that social interaction, I think is really important. Um, I am a, a closeted introvert, but even I was having issues with not interacting with people. So I, I just wanna kind of like put that out there. Um, phys physicists in, in general are really good at pivoting. Um, and I wanna kind of call out, it's not a project that I was working on, but when COVID hit, there were physicists at Fermilab that really tried to think about how they could use their skills to help um, in the time of COVID. And they are in the process of testing um, an off the shelf ventilator that they've created with, you know, products that you can just get from Home Depot or I don't know. <laughs> I'm not part of the project, but essentially that's what they're doing. And they're already in the testing phases because we knew, I mean, cause we look at data all the time. We knew this is gonna get bad, right? And if you look at some of the models that are out there on Google, you'll see that physicists were actually the ones that were, you know, collating the data and showing you what an exponential looks like, <laughs> right? Uh, so we knew that it was gonna get bad and physicists at Fermilab pivoted so they could, you know, create this, this, this ventilator because we knew we were going to need it. Um, but as far as like internships and RU experiences, um, I think we should look at, well, there's two things. I think we should look at COVID uh, as a way to open up a whole bunch of doors. And we should also look at the Black Lives Matter movement as opening a whole bunch of doors because I am seeing a reckoning and I love to see it <laughs> at institutions, universities, organizations across the country that are realizing, ooh, we've done real bad when it comes to ED&I. So y'all are smart already, but now you've become a hot commodity, right? So use that, you know? You don't even have to sell yourself anymore. They know they've done us wrong. <laughs> so start going into people's inboxes with regards to our mm -hmm. use and internships and say, you know, I see the demographics. You need me. How are we going to make this work? That's so true. Very true. At least me personally for COVID, uh, uh, I was fortunate enough that I, was, I wasn't laid off. Um, I was able to keep my job. It just looked a lot different. Like I said, I usually travel 75% of the time. So even from COVID being on lockdown for almost three months before I traveled, in that time, I spent more time at home in that time than I did all of last year. So that just tells you the, the change it was for me. But even with that, so uh, doing things differently as far as like, um, using virtual ways to do trainings and things like that. Um, and then meeting with colleagues with virtually as well. So we were able to do some things virtually, some other stuff got postponed. Now I'm traveling a little bit more, so I'm semi-normal. I don't know if it's ever gonna actually be normal. We always talk about this new normal we're experiencing. But I will say as far as encouragement for you guys out there that, um, may have had some internships that they they weren't you weren't able to do maybe you were accepted you weren't able to do them anymore or it looks a little bit differently 
I think this whole world around COVID and even like what Dr. Esquirel said about the Black Lives Matter movement has really opened eyes about what the possibilities are as far as what we can do virtually versus what we have to be on site to do. So I know a lot of times, like if there's stuff in um, another city or another state that, and uh, depending on what the opportunity is, they might not provide for travel and they want you to be there, but I think this opens it up um, going forward that maybe even if you can't move out there, there's still some stuff you can do from a data analysis side or from a research side, um, things like that. So I really think the world that we're, we're living in now has opened up a lot of opportunities. I even saw some stuff about some of the tech companies like Google and Twitter. They're going fully virtual that people can work from home. And even like on my side of things, they're saying uh, like, you can, you can work. some people are going back to office, other people are staying back at home just to limit the people coming in. But I, do, I also think this, this time is an opportunity uh, for personal growth as far as if it's um, reading books, uh, this weekly series you guys have been involved in, talking to people um, in STEM and different careers. I think as the fact that you guys are even on this call really shows that you, you care about your growth, you care about doing stuff in this time. And that's really key. And that, that keeps you sane as far as the interaction with other people. It definitely doesn't look the same. It's not the same as um, being in a, a conference or a panel type atmosphere where you can see someone sitting next to you. But at least you, there's still some conversations you can type in the chat, things like that. I will say another thing that would be good to do if you're not already doing it is uh, maybe set up some times to connect with, with friends virtually as well if you're not comfortable um, being them in person or if they're in different states. I know for me, um, be, just from traveling a lot and being in different places, being able to connect with, I think, more people that would have normally been able to just from being intentional and reaching out. So um, hang in there. It's definitely a tough time. I can't, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's hard on everyone. I think it's especially hard um, for you guys as, as students if you were expect, expecting internships and for other stuff moving forward. I think with the climate the way it is, um, a lot of people are in the same situation as far as opportunities not being there. So at least um, that's one thing to look forward to that it, everyone is kind of in the same boat so it doesn't hinder, you're not set behind anyone else. It's what you do in this time that can help you um, set you forward. All right, well thank you, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just gonna well. say, before we wrap up, I also, want to say like full disclosure moving into covid my productivity went down down <laughs> so don't be hard on yourself yeah. like this is unfathom it's a freaking pandemic on top of a protest that has been in all 50 countries don't expect that you're going to be at the same level of productivity that we were four months ago like if I can, you know, log in to a terminal and get one thing done, that is a good day. Mm -hmm. Don't be hard on yourself. Yeah, that's true. I second that. Have some grace <laughs> with it. <laughs> so I, I like one to say thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. And I want to just touch on a couple of key takeaways. I've added a few and uh, here's some ones that we thought that we wanted to share with you guys is it's okay to change directions. It could be academically or professionally. Um, you can overcome the imposter syndrome, right? We were talking about the academic side, but also the professional side. Uh, your first job doesn't have to be your last job. Uh, we're going to have careers, uh, and careers spanned over many years. Um, be a continuous learner. Uh, don't give up on learning. Even if you're not officially in school, just continue to be a learner. Get many experiences early and often. You know, uh, get diversity in your experience so you can have diversity in your career and mm -hmm. leverage that mentor. And I think we learned tonight the difference between mentor versus a sponsor. And that sponsor is a person that's opening the door where the mentor can tell you where the door is. Uh, that's kind of the way I like to explain it, but you need that sponsor too. So I um, also just wanted to share just real briefly um, a few reflection questions for uh, those students that have a uh, little bit of homework assignment, but those that uh, just want to think about these things. What are your top three STEM career options uh, you have, um, have you considered, I'm sorry, 
Um, and I really just want you to think about options and we're, this is really important because many STEM students kind of put themselves in a box and they don't know they have options, so you do. Have you interviewed anyone in your top three STEM career choices? Um, and then also have you considered any entrepreneurial endeavors in your future STEM career? So we want you to also think outside of just a normal career. Uh, we want you to have some diversity in your career options, uh, either academia, industry, or entrepreneurial uh, endeavors. Uh, I'll bypass my little ugly face here and go to saying thank you to our collaborators. Uh, we do appreciate the efforts that have been taken to, to make this series a success. And then also we do still have three uh, more sessions for this summer. Uh, we are seven down with three more to go. And I just wanted to uh, share next week as we talk about abstracts and posters, um, Darian James and Alexis uh, Lampkin are going to be with us next week as we prepare uh, to get you ready for abstracts and posters. So uh, as we wrap up, you guys know how we like to do it. If there's um, a student that like to raise their hand, we'd like to hear your voice um, and share your thoughts and feedback or appreciation for uh, our guest tonight. And you can use your raise your hand feature. Uh, if you like. uh, Marie, is that you with your hand up there? I don't know if Marie's got her, her phone off mute. Uh, Mr. Evan, how you doing, Evan? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Just surviving. Um, I just want to say thank you for the for the very, 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 very important meeting or session, I should say, because it really, because I'm not gonna lie, with COVID going on, I did feel a little bit discouraged about my STEM field work because I felt like, oh, I'm not doing as well inside. But it was really encouraging to hear all these different perspectives and experiences. So I just wanted to thank everyone involved. Thank you, Evan. Was there anyone else like to share any feedback tonight for our guests? I don't know if Marie was able to get off mute there. I know she had her hand raised. Uh, Ruth, hey, Ruth. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that this was like very enlightening, like the whole session. I really enjoyed listening to this. I don't even know where to start from like, with mentioning everything that I've learned, but this was very enlightening. So I just wanted to say thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you do you think Ruth um have you sat on some of the other sessions, Ruth? Yes, I've been here for like the like three sessions ago. <laughs> Three sessions. Do you do you really enjoy like do you think that the panel and having the different backgrounds of people on the panels and things has that been very uh you know, you you think that's very beneficial tonight? Outside the fact that there's, you know, these they're they're just awesome people, you know. <laughs> I don't wanna hype their heads up anymore, you know what I'm saying? But they are great. They are great. Yes, I, I think it's great that like there's different people because it's great to have like different perspectives because like each person is like from a different field. So it's like great to hear like how everything is still connected in a way, but it's still like so important. Like, and it's like the same underlying message at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I'll wrap up with Angelica. Wasn't sure if you... Angelica, if you wanted to speak up, if there was an accident there. Nope. Okay. Uh, one of the things I did want to say is one of the cool things about our guests is, listen, I hope you realize after spending uh, your time with them tonight that they're humans, right? They're regular people, but they are doing some awesome stuff, right? I'm not, I'm not going to uh, devalue how critical their work is, how important their work is, and the, the struggle and the sacrifice and the challenges that they've overcome to get where they are. So we're not going to devalue the work, but I do want you to know that they're humans and they feel pain just like you feel pain. They have hurt, they have emotions just like you do, but they are examples 
that ordinary people can do some extraordinary things. And so I really challenge you to, to look at them as examples. Uh, these are my heroes. Uh, these guests tonight are the type of people that I want to aspire to be uh, and motivate me and hope my, hope my children look up and these are superheroes. So I can't wait to get the t-shirts the and all that stuff because I've I got a vision of things I want to do to, to highlight uh, these type of wonderful people because you guys are the superheroes. So at Comic-Con, Dr. Esquivel, they're going to have they're going to have to have you there as a superhero one day. You don't even know. I cosplay <laughs> on the side. You're go Just wait. <laughs> Carla, it's only I don't know. It's like the, the Avengers of physics is like 150 There's 150 of us coming for you. <laughs> for sure. For sure. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining. We thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Thank you.